Welcome to week two of You Asked For It. Yes. Okay, I'm Jason, your guide on today's theological minefield. Last Sunday, we tackled the most interesting and highest ranked questions under the topics of family, fatherhood, and the freaky in-laws. And we had a blast. If you missed it, go and check it out on westsidefamilychurch.com. But today, we have a ton of work to do because most of your questions landed into this big bucket of theological spaghetti. And I am so glad that we have our guest with us because this guy really knows his stuff all the way from prelapsarian to post-tribulational, but he also has the uncanny ability to boil stuff down because honestly, your questions were so out there sometimes. I mean, and this guy has the ability to take these spacey ethereal questions out in some predestination station in orbit somewhere and bring it right down to the living room. So um, let's get going because we got a lot of diem to carpe Let's talk with the doc who can still walk the walk. He's got so much gray matter, he can't find a cowboy hat that fits. <laughs> Dan, the U.S. Foreign Answer Man, Sutherland. Thank you, bro. <laughs> if you're wondering if I ever know what he's going to say, the answer is no. <laughs> it changes service to service. You got to keep awesome. it fun, man. Got to have some fun. Hey, thanks for being at Westside today. We've already had a great 8.30 service here at 9.45. we got folks in worshiping up at Speedway. They'll be worshiping up at Lansing in the prison tonight. Got people from all over the world. Oh, you already yeah. Checked. we got China, UK, South Africa, Sam Jen. Hi, how's it going? From all over the place. On the internet, checking in as well. So we're grateful today also for your questions. Wow, you have asked some great stuff. And uh, bless you for doing that. Turn to your neighbor and say you made a good choice to come to Westside today. Tell them. Made a good choice. We're glad you're here. Okay, Dan, before we get started on some of these questions, why don't you give us, go over that framework again. I think the framework really matters. So grab your notes, write some things down. I'm going to cover 15 minutes worth of stuff in three minutes. Are you ready? <laughs> Here's the premise of why we do You Asked For It. Christ followers should be seekers of truth in every arena of our lives. I was taught, Jason, growing up, you just don't ask questions about God. Right. Of course you ask questions about God. He welcomes our questions. In fact, Jesus will give us wisdom, write that in, when we ask for it. So now the question really is, well, where do we turn with those questions? And give you three ideas today. This is what the series is built on. First, you turn to the Scripture. God has given us an owner's manual that answers most of our theological and most of our practical everyday questions. And you look at three levels, direct teaching, principles, examples. Secondly, if we don't find the answer there or we find it, but we need to make really sure we turn to God in prayer. We turn to God in prayer. And this means that we say, hey, God, need your wisdom. Are you going to show up? And again, he's already promised that he will. Thirdly, after we've looked to the Bible, after we've looked in prayer, we turn to wise counsel. Would you circle the word wise? Here's the problem. 14-year-olds <laughs> ask other 14-year-olds, what do you think I ought to do? Bad idea. <laughs> we tend to ask people at our same age and stage right. of life. There are folks ahead of us that have already done this, messed it up, figured it out, and eventually got it right. And the Bible talks about the value of gray hair, about the value of going <laughs> after folks with some wisdom. So that's the premise of this whole lesson. Your questions are good. Go to the Bible first. Go to prayer second. Go for wise counsel third. Okay, let's get started then. First question from Lenexa. If your children are young, under the age of 10, and they pass away without being baptized, will they go to heaven? I love the question because it's from a parent who's concerned about the salvation of their child, and that's the right concern. But let me repoint the, the direction. Baptism is not the issue that settles heaven. Belief is the issue of heaven. 
So the idea that my child was baptized, therefore they're in, not a scriptural basis for that. The idea is belief. Do you understand right and wrong, and are you willing to believe Jesus died to take care of that? Yeah, but what if they're too young to get the belief part? No, if they're too young, you're already talking to them about Jesus. That's the important piece. But there's a verse over in 2 Samuel in chapter 12, verse 22, where David goes through the experience, King David, of one of his kids dying, Jason, right after he's been born just a few right. days and david says i will see my child again i will go to my child he's talking about heaven so god covers by grace kids that are not old enough to understand the difference in right and wrong and the need for a savior but it's our job to make sure they move toward belief not toward baptism okay now on that whole afterlife theme there was another question that came in that asks hundreds of people die each day how long do you think the judgment process will take and do you think we'll have to wait in line because i don't do well waiting in line <laughs> I i'm not making these question. up it's a real question it's a real question um, what they're talking about obviously is the bible talks about after this world is done everyone that's ever lived will be judged and i guess they're asking if there's millions of people waiting well, in line well there'll be billions yeah, of billions. all human history you yeah. know that's going to be like a long line you know what right. do we do with that your question dude what do you think <laughs> okay um, okay well first of all i think a lot of times and this i think goes true for the uh, really a lot of these theological questions we tend to box god into our limits yes and you need to really think twice about doing that because God isn't limited in the same way that we are. You need to understand that even time is one of God's creations. And so God's not limited to time. God's not limited to space. He knows everything. And God can inject himself into our time-space continuum whenever he wants to. So don't put those limits on him. And I don't think there's really going to be a line because God can judge everyone simultaneously because time is not his problem. He, he's doing that right now. Think about it. Two billion Christ followers around the world hopefully worshiping together as a group sometime today. Is God able to speak to each of us individually at the same time? Yes. Well, if he can speak to us and lead us at the same time, why can't he judge us and be done? I'm convinced if there's waiting in heaven, that's not heaven. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, so. you know, and even, even Psalms talks about this. Psalm 94 says, to God, a thousand years are a day. Yeah. In, in his sight. He's timeless. Because he's, yeah, that whole concept of time just doesn't even factor in. I he's think that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, the next one asks about the end times. If the Bible says that the world will spiral downward and people will turn from him, like it says in the book of Revelation, then how are we as Christians supposed to motivate ourselves to try to bring more to Christ? Well, I think that does motivate me. The fact that the, the world is spiraling downward spiritually means to me the darker it gets in our culture, the brighter the light of Jesus shines. I mean, the darkest night produces the best campfires because that firelight really shows out in the darkness. So this challenges me to step up, and I do believe we're getting close to the end. So we've got a limited amount of time to share. Luke 10, Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful, but there's not enough workers. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers. That's me and you. So if Jesus is praying as the end gets closer for us to get busier about the gospel, then we need to get busier. Well, I, I, I understand that part, but I think that what is kind of behind the question is, if the world's just going to blow up anyway, and if everyone that's going to know Jesus is just going to know him anyway, why even bother? That's a great question, and I think the reality is this. God does know who's going to come to him and who doesn't. But nonetheless, he says, it's your job to tell them. Romans right. 10 says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and then it asks a question. How will they hear if nobody tells them? So our part is the telling. God's part is the saving. He takes care of it. Okay. All right, um, another question that's kind of related to that that comes to mind. I've, actually, there's a lot of questions that are under this particular topic. So I'm just going to stick about three really good ones and stick them in the blender together. Okay. All right, and see how you handle this one. Okay. I have been asked to prove God exists to someone who once believed but now says there can't possibly be a God because he would not have let Joplin happen mm. or all the issues with the economy or my unemployment. 
Um, every now and then, this is from another person, I again have these random thoughts that basically say God isn't real. Now, I firmly believe he does, but it still happens. Am I alone in this? And then another person asked, why can't anyone see God? And wouldn't it be easier for him to show himself to people instead of having people rely on faith only? Wow. So of all there. of this stuff in the blender about how does God exist if this stuff bad happens? Or why doesn't he just show himself? Does he even exist at all? Well, the first point was, was how do I, you know, I've been asked to prove God exists. Time out. It is not your job to prove the existence of God. That is God's job. And when somebody says to you, prove to me God exists, I say to them back, dude, that's your problem to work through. I know he exists. I've worked through it. Now, if you're asking me why I believe he exists, I'll talk to you. But you're throwing down the gauntlet for me to prove that God exists? I don't have to prove that. That is God's job, not our job. It's always dangerous to take on God's job. Does that make sense? Always dangerous to try to do what God only can do. Secondly, they're asking in here, if there is a God, how can Joplin happen? Right. And the issue here, Jason, it tells us in Matthew 5 that good and bad things happen to good and bad people. Jesus said it will rain on the godly and the ungodly. Let's kick it up a notch. It will storm on the godly and the ungodly. Let's kick it up a notch. It will tornado on yeah. the godly okay. and the ungodly. That is part of life on this planet. Jesus said you will have trouble in this world. So far in my 55 years, he's been right. <laughs> so, my yeah, thought is not that, tr that trouble proves there's no God. It's that when we cry out to God in the midst of our trouble, we experience Him in a brand new way. Thirdly, they asked, you know, sometimes I doubt that God's even real. Me too, every Monday morning. <laughs> I mean, honestly, folks, I start my day on Sunday about 7 o'clock. I finish about 10.30 or 11 at Sunday night when my life group is done. And on Monday, I don't even believe in God. Now, some of you are going, our pastor doesn't believe in God. I do hear, I can't feel it here. Are you with me? I know he exists, but I've got doubts based on my feelings. What do you do with your doubts? Doubt your doubts. That's what you do with your doubts. I mean, when I'm doing that, I don't even know if I believe this or feel this deal. I doubt them. I go, wait a minute. I know better than that. I've seen God work. And that's the last thing they said, Jason, was what, wouldn't it be easier if Jesus just made himself visible? Yeah, I wonder that too. Yeah, I mean, you know, wouldn't it be easier to believe in him if we could see him? Right. I say we can see him. We can see him in creation. We can see him in conscious, those moments when we're convicted inside. We can see him in changed lives. In our 830 service this morning, there was a family on the front row, a friend of mine and his wife, who had a nine-day-old baby in their arms. I can see God in that circumstance. And I told Mike, I can really see God because the baby looks like your wife, not like you. <laughs> So I believe we have the opportunity to see God and all that he's doing. We just got to open our eyes and see it. I think another aspect of that, too, is that I think that we can see about as much of God as we could handle anyway. I totally agree. I mean, if we saw all of God, wow. Right. Wow. It talks about in heaven, we'll be able to handle a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Okay. Now, about this whole concept of the existence of God and trying to explain that to people, um, I got this question from Lenexa. How do you explain the Trinity to those from other religions, such as Islam, that don't understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as being one God? Mm. We have Muslim friends that don't understand that we're not polytheistic, and we've not found a way to explain to them well how they are all one God. It's a difficult concept. It's a mystery to start with. And by the way, Jason, I don't want a God I can fully explain because yeah. if I can fully explain God, he's got my IQ, and we're all in trouble. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, I certainly don't want a God you can explain. <laughs> we just don't want to go there. But there is a great question here. I think we as Christ followers have confused the idea of the Trinity because we've talked a lot about God in three persons. Right. There's one yeah. God. He has three different roles. Let me see if I can explain it using an example for me. There's one, Dan Sutherland, and yet I am a husband to my wife, I am a father to my kids, and I am a grandfather to my grandkids. Does that mean there's three of me? There's one of me, three roles, three ways I reveal myself. 
You know, there's Dan who loves Mary, there's Dan who teaches the kids, and there's Dan who spoils the grandkids. <laughs> we have God who is one and yet reveals himself in three ways. There's God the Father who rules the universe. There's Jesus the Son who saves. There is the Holy Spirit who leads us. Do I fully get that? No. Do I want to fully get that? No. But it's one God. It's one God. And quite honestly, I don't have many Muslims claiming we have three gods as much as I have them saying we've got the wrong God. That's the conversation that's fun to have. Okay. Well, and that brings to mind this concept of, you know, other belief systems. Because I have another question from Lenexa that asks, I grew up Catholic and now attend Westside. When I go to a Catholic mass or a wedding, should I participate like a Catholic? Uh, like reciting prayers, kneeling, or whatever. If I was baptized Catholic, am I Catholic? I love the question because most of the folks yeah, at Westside have some like kind that. of Catholic background right. at some point in their lives. So it's, it's a great, great question. Uh, Jesus was once asked in John chapter 4 about worship. He was asked, well, should we worship, you know, in the temple or on the mountain? Should we worship this way or this way? It was a style right. of worship question. And Jesus' response was, true worship's about spirit and truth, not about form or ritual or label. And I think what I would say is that, that idea, when I go to a Catholic service, and I do from time to time, uh, when I'm off from here, I love that experience. I love the liturgical piece. I fully participate. Why whoa, whoa, whoa. is that? Fully participate? I fully participate. Now, what does I, that look like when they start praying to Mary and stuff? Great question. Now, here's my deal. <laughs> when they're praying to Mary, I'm not talking to Mary. I'm talking to Mary's boss. Oh, you yeah, with that me? makes sense. I mean, yeah. why do you settle for the mother of the boss when you can get to the boss? Everybody there? Why am I going to talk to some designated saint when I can get to the person that is in charge? So while they're praying that kind of a prayer, I'm talking to Jesus. Why? Because when I'm in a Catholic service, I'm not worshiping Catholicism. Any more than when I'm in a West Side service, I'm worshiping West Sideism. Mm. I'm worshiping Jesus. And you can worship Jesus in any setting. So when you find yourself there, go for that. In terms of if I was Catholic, am I still Catholic? Jason, my deal is this. I was raised Baptist. I still think of myself as Baptist. But what I know is that Baptist is this level of important, and Christ follower is this level of of importance. Mm, right. And I can't even use those words in the same sentence without feeling strange about it. Why? Man-made denominational label, God-ordained reality. Which one's going to live forever? Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you regardless of your Heinz 47 background. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> 57, 47, 67. <laughs> love you regardless. Not okay. an issue. All right. Now, Speaking of this whole church thing, it, it brings up to mind this one particular question. It doesn't necessarily fit in a theological one, but it was so good I had to include it. Now, just hang tight. It's kind of long, but you know, okay. I would really like you to address this. Um, I just recently gave my life to Christ, and I want to honor him with my life in every way possible. But it seems that the more my calendar fills with church activities, the more burned out I get. I feel a lot of pressure and sometimes mm. guilt, all self-imposed, yes. if I don't want to go to Bible study every week or if I'm too tired to volunteer for an activity. I realize that in order to grow, I need to do these things, but I also feel that if I start to resent the activities, that that would be detrimental to my spiritual growth as well. I hate feeling this way, but I do. What should I do to grow closer to Christ without losing the passion? It's a great question. I, it reminds me of a nursery rhyme that I've twisted a bit, and it goes like this. Mary had a little lamb. The lamb became a sheep. The sheep then joined the local church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I've not had breakfast this morning. Have you had breakfast? Oh, yeah. You had breakfast. Yeah. I haven't. Let's pretend for a moment that these two tables are stacked a foot high with every breakfast food known to mankind. Blueberries? Blueberries for you. Awesome. Yes, all of that stacked up <laughs> here. There's no way you and I can eat it all. 
Church is a buffet of activities and ministry opportunities. Nobody should try to do it all. If you try to do it all, you will surely die. <laughs> we need to know that. And balance is the key. Does church growth require activity? Yes. But does church growth, excuse me, does personal growth require activity? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does personal growth also require rest? Yes. Wow. And the same Spirit of God is able to lead us that we talked about earlier. He can say to those of us that are doing too much, slow down. Let something go. Mm -hmm. And he's also capable of saying to those of us who aren't doing anything, get off your blessed assurance. <laughs> Balance is the key. Okay. All right. Now, I got a whole truckload of questions on is this a sin? Is that a sin? Is this a sin? Is that a sin? So here's what I want to do. I want to just like rapid fire style, give them to you, answer me in five seconds or less, yes or no, give me a scripture verse, done. Okay? Five seconds. Yeah. I make no commitment to five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> you ready? Let's give okay. it a shot. Lying. Absolutely a sin. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, great commandments, God's top 10 list. Don't okay. Lie. Uh, dying your hair. Dying your hair. According I'm not to my, coming up with this stuff. I mean, according to my wife, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gambling. Gambling is, is a big issue because not of the gambling itself, but the stuff that goes with it. This is not a five second answer. There is addiction issues. There is stupid expenditure of money issues. There are issues about where you go and who you're with. There's a lot of stuff that can really get you in trouble with gambling. Shaving your legs. Shaving your legs. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe Scripture talks about shaving no? your legs. Okay. No, sir. Kill people in war. To kill people in war is an issue the Bible deals with, and it's clear, particularly in the Old Testament, that God leads his people to go to war to protect themselves as a nation. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about protecting us, protecting ourselves, and, and killing folks, absolutely no issue. What about civil disobedience? Civil disobedience. There are moments when it's necessary, Jason, and that what are those moments? You, you submit to the highest authority. If government's saying one thing and God is saying something else, I got news for the government. I'm going to disobey the government. And there are places in the world where that happens. There's places in the world where it's illegal to worship Jesus Christ. You know what? I'm breaking that rule. I'm breaking that rule because you submit to the higher authority. Wearing makeup. Wearing makeup. I don't wear any. <laughs> uh, scripture talks about not trying to make yourself out through too much makeup or too much jewelry to be somebody you're not. My wife's statement is that even an old barn looks better with a fresh coat of paint. <laughs> okay. Cover your face. Okay. She said it. I didn't. All right. Email her. <laughs> Okay, what about wearing clothes? Wearing clothes. That was one of the questions, dude. Jason, it would be a sin for me to not wear clothes. Okay, okay. bro, I, yeah. All right, what about gluttony? Gluttony's clearly a sin, one I struggle with, I love to eat. But, but taking on too much of anything, doing anything to access is gluttony, and Scripture clearly forbids it. Is it a sin to be angry even after forgiving? The sin is not in being angry. That's an important idea. In fact, the Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. There are some things that should make us angry. I am angry about the fact that we throw away millions of babies in abortions every year. I am angry about the fact that with child abuse is rampant in our country. Uh, but if you're talking about a more personal issue, yeah, I, I think the issue is not my anger, it's my lack of control when I am angry. We can actually harness anger to help us to do good things. Um, yeah, but, but where does anger and forgiveness fit? Because that was the question. Well, if I'm angry because you've hurt me and I've forgiven you, but I'm still angry, yeah. there's a chance I probably really haven't forgiven you or that I've got to choose to forgive you again. I mean, every time I want to smack you, it's a better call that I, to choose to forgive you. So I've got to keep choosing. And what I've also noticed, Jason, is this. Many times people who struggle to forgive others have a root issue of forgiving themselves. 
Uh, and it's the fact that they're not happy. They feel condemned themselves. Therefore, they're willing to condemn others. Well, that's a lot like uh, another question that I had that's right on that same topic. Um, it asks, how is it possible to really put all of your sins behind you and know that God loves you and wants you? Your question. <laughs> Jason okay. knows that a couple of times in each of these, I'm going to throw him a question. He just okay. doesn't know which one. So uh, this sounds like a good one for you. All right. Uh, what well, comes to my scripture, right? Part of the framework. First uh, John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just mm -hmm. to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I am so glad that verse depends not upon my faithfulness, right. but on his faithfulness faithfulness. And if perchance, and I love that book of First John, and if perchance your heart just can't seem to get over that truth, because it's a matter of faith to believe that truth. Later on in First John in 3.20, it says, even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Hmm. And he knows all things. He does. That's a big idea, guys. In fact, in Romans 8, verse 1, let me say this clearly. It, it, for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are Christ's followers, the Bible says there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. Now, don't miss this. This is an important distinction. God convicts us about our sin. He puts his finger on it and says, that attitude is not of me. You need to quit doing that. That action is not like me. He, he convicts us. He does not condemn us so if you're stuck in a spot where you're still feeling guilty over something you did years ago but you've asked god to forgive you for and you can't get past the condemnation i've got great news that's not god god says you're free god says you're forgiven god says you're not condemned because you're following christ and you've given it to him okay and that whole spiritual line of thinking. I have another question that asks, I want to know about prayer and spiritual warfare and related themes. Hmm. What should a Christian know about spiritual warfare or to be practicing regularly? Wow. Well, it's a big question. I think the first thing Christ followers need to get a clue on is the spiritual warfare in this world is much bigger than the physical warfare. We spend so much of our time concerned about physical things. How right. do I make money? How do I take care of my family? How do I make sure we've got food to eat? We have to do those. But there's a spiritual world going here as well. And Ephesians 6 would be the best passage. Start about verse 10, go to verse 19 or 20, where it says in verse 10, Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual authority in high places. Translation. The battle we're in is not for this world. It is for the souls of the men and the women and the children in this world. Hmm. And God has you stationed on the front line in your neighborhood to battle for the souls of the people in your neighborhood. He's got you stationed on the front line in your workplace to be part of the spiritual warfare for the souls of those people. And it talks about in Ephesians 6, we have so many weapons. We have the Word of God, which is our sword. We have prayer which is a huge weapon. We have the gospel of peace. If you're not certain about your own salvation, you don't have enough peace to talk to others about it. We are in a spiritual battle. It's time for us to wake up and get on it. Well, talking about that spiritual battle and having one of our weapons being prayer and opening our minds to that whole spiritual perception of what's going on, I had a lot of questions actually on this particular topic mm -hmm. that basically can be summarized like this. I don't know if you ever had the feeling of needing to stop whatever you're doing and pray for something or for someone, or how do you hear from God and know when he wants us to say yes or no to decisions that we make in our lives? There's two great questions in there. The, the idea of have you ever just sensed you're supposed to stop and pray for someone, that ought to be normal happening for the Christ follower. And we've all had it from time to time. I had one just a few days ago where a friend of mine just came to mind in the middle of the afternoon, and I prayed for him and texted him and said, just prayed for you, don't know what's going on, love you. I see him the next day, and he says, at that exact moment, this is the crisis I was in the middle of. It was really weird when you texted me. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> You can go for the weird stuff there and say you're psychic. You're not psychic. You're not that good. 
It's the Spirit of God that said, hey, Dan, pray for Josh. Right. He's in a crisis right now. Do I have to know the crisis? No, but I can be urged to pray. The other piece of how do you hear from God and know when he wants you to say yes or no? Jason, that's what this whole series has been about. You go through the process of taking your honest questions to God. Look to the Bible first. Look to prayer second. Look to yeah, wise counsel great third. Framework. And then the final thing that happens is that Philippians 4 thing where it says, when you've done that and you've got the right answer, the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart. And your mind. And your mind. The way you feel, the way you think. The way you feel and the way you think will line up and you'll yeah. have peace in both. And then you know God is speaking God's lead me. Well, that seems like a great place for us to end for today. I know that you have more questions that you want to hear. And at 6.15, we're going to have our Sunday night dump truck session for all these other weird topics that you brought up. And really, it's going to be about as weird as Tom Cruise, all the way from <laughs> dinosaurs to aliens and all the stuff that's in between. We will see you tonight. And, and we that's won't. not worship time. That's just an right. hour. Just questions. And 30 minutes of it is the questions they've already asked, Jason. Right. And then the next 30 is going to be live questions that you text in, and we will just see what happens. And if you don't like it, just always remember, you asked for it.